Good evening all and uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, KMA Nairobi Division in conjunction with Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Uh, the topic will be increased risk of uh, pneumococcal burden in adults with comorbidities and value of pneumococcal vaccination. Uh, my name is Ogeto Peter Ugero. Uh, I'll be a moderator today. Uh, we'll give around uh, five minutes to let us attendees join us before we start. Thank you for taking time to join us today. Uh, at the bottom, there is a chat area. Feel free to tell us where we're watching us from. Karibu sana. Good evening once again. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us this, this evening for our webinar. <clears throat> uh, today we'll be having a talk, we'll be having a talk by Dr. Chakaya Mungwa. Dr. Chakaya is a practicing respiratory physician based in Nairobi, Kenya. I graduated from University of Nairobi with a basic degree in medicine and surgery. Um, Dr. Chakaya has several positions, including at the international level, he has several positions, including chair of direct observed short courses, expansion of work group, <coughs> vice chair of the STOP TB partnership, uh, and many others. Today, we'll be taking us through the topic uh, increased risk of pneumococcal burden in adults with comorbidities and value of pneumococcal vaccination. Uh, this is a webinar that is has been organized by KMA Nairobi Division in conjunction with Pfizer, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Uh, this juncture, I want to welcome you all and uh, Karibu Dr. to take off. Thank you very much for the kind presentation and thank you for uh, Pfizer for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. And thank you to all the people who have joined this uh, webinar. 
it's a, these are difficult times. Uh, one would wish that uh, it was our usual thing that we are doing where we can see each other face to face and interact and uh, I can get to see your faces and get to know whether I am in fact getting through to you or not. But uh, there we are, we are in the virtual world and uh, we have to make do with what is, uh, what is there. Uh, I really hope that uh, um, uh, this talk will be useful to all of you. I was requested to speak about the uh, pneumococcal disease uh, and uh, how it affects people around the world and uh, how vaccinations may help uh, reduce the suffering uh, and morbid morbidities and mortalities due to this uh, particular germ. Um, I must tell you from the word go that this is uh, um, uh, the things that I'm going to say today are completely my views and have nothing to do with the sponsor of the meeting uh, today. I thought I would, uh, uh, I would go through with you uh, some key uh, concepts and definitions so that we all understand what we mean by pneumococcal disease, the diseases that this germ causes. We will highlight a little bit about uh, the pathogen, the burden at these populations, uh, and how to prevent uh, pneumococcal disease and then make a few conclusions at the end. So maybe to begin with, um, why is this uh, germ called the Streptococcus pneumoniae important uh, to us? Uh, pneumo the pneumococcus causes lots of diseases and you can divide those diseases into two groups, non-invasive pneumococcal disease, uh, which include pneumonia that is not associated with bacteremia, uh, acute otitis media, especially in children, and acute sinusitis in addition to local infections within the upper airway. And then you've got uh, the big ones that uh, often can be associated with higher mortality. And this uh, pneumonia that is associated with the um, uh, blood invasion, uh, so pneumonia with bacteremia, or sometimes the situations where you have uh, isolated bacteremia without a pneumonia uh, and a very serious infection uh, that involves the meninges in the, uh, in the brain. So maybe before we start looking at uh, these diseases and how we can prevent it, may, it may be a good thing to just remind ourselves about the germ that we call streptococcus pneumonia. This germ is uh, a gram-positive facultative anaerobe. Uh, it was a... Um, identified many years ago, uh, the days of Fleming and others. It's, um, uh, it has a, a complex polysaccharide wall, and that polysaccharide wall is what has been used to um, uh, type um, um, what we call um, uh, serotypes of this, uh, uh, of this uh, germ. And currently there are uh, maybe more than 100 serotypes uh, of uh, streptococcus pneumonia. And these serotypes are based, of course, on this complex uh, uh, polysaccharides that uh, uh, make the envelope of this uh, particular germ. Uh, even though there are very many um, serotypes of uh, pneumococci, only a few cause disease, as we will see uh, going forward. Uh, this germ is a commensal in the nasopharynx, so uh, a lot of people carry this germ in the nasopharynx. The carriage rates of the, the pneumococci will vary depending on geography, age, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and even ethnicity to some extent. And it can be uh, anything up to 90% of the population uh, in certain settings that are carrying uh, the pneumococcus. Uh, so you have higher rates of uh, courage in children uh, and lower rates of courage in adults. Uh, and in those that are children, the courage rates tend to vary uh, with um, uh, exposure, for example, to children and also whether you are living in a congregate setting or not. Uh, if you look at some of the data that has come through, this was a meta-analysis of several studies that looked at uh, um, uh, pneumococcal courage rates or colonization in the adult population. Uh, 
they looked at the uh, 29 studies with uh, uh, slightly more than 6,000 participants. And um, depending on whether uh, one used the uh, conventional culture uh, or used molecular methods, the rates of courage of uh, the pneumococcus varied from zero to 39% using culture and two to 3% using molecular methods. The risk factors for uh, being colonized with the pneumococcus were uh, the three things that I've shown on that slide. Uh, if you're a resident in nursing homes, um, I don't think we have a lot of nursing homes in our country yet. We haven't reached that stage of uh, uh, social development, if I can call it that, or social misdevelopment, uh, because we take care of our adults. Smoking uh, and regular contact with children. Uh, so I think for us, maybe the bigger thing that we need to worry about is this uh, story about regular contact with children, either as parents or grandparents, as, as it were. The pneumococcus has uh, multiple virulence factors, and I'm not going to go into this uh, uh, very intense uh, molecular bio uh, biological concepts here. But uh, all these virulence factors help this um, particular pathogen to adhere to epithelial uh, cells within the airway, penetrate those cells, cause cell lysis, evade uh, immunological mechanisms that would otherwise uh, um, uh, be operational uh, to keep this pathogen at bay. Uh, so uh, it is a smart bug like, uh, uh, like, uh, like many other bugs uh, that has been endured with uh, multiple factors to be able to uh, adhere and evade immune responses in the host. If you look at the kind of diseases that this particular germ causes, in our country several years ago, uh, Anthony J. Scott and others estimated that nearly half of all the cases of pneumonia in our country were caused by uh, the streptococcus. And uh, uh, about 25 to 30% of these cases uh, would have bacteremia also. But you can also get uh, uh, bacteremia without pneumonia, and uh, uh, the pneumococcus is responsible for about 50% of all forms of purulent meningitis or bacterial meningitis. So it's a, 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 an extremely important uh, pathogen. Um, I want us to deal now with the epidemiological uh, dimensions of, uh, um, of this pathogen and uh, the amount of disease that it causes uh, in the populations around the world. Lower respiratory tract infections uh, are currently, well, I think right now they are probably the number one cause of, uh, of, of, of uh, morbidity and mortality because of the ongoing pandemic due to SARS-CoV-2. But before SARS-CoV-2, uh, lower respiratory tract infections were number four in terms of uh, uh, the cause of death um, around the world. Um, um, but that depended to a large extent on where you were. If you were living in a low income country or low and middle income countries, uh, lower respiratory infectious disease generally, uh, both the real diseases and lower respiratory tract infections were the most common cause uh, of death in, in those settings, at least by 2016. Uh, you can see that lower respiratory tract infections are way uh, out there. And in children, for example, it's been estimated, or it was estimated by the World Health Organization that a child dies of pneumonia every 20 seconds. So every time you do something like that 20 times, some child has died from pneumonia somewhere in the world. A real big problem uh, for, for all of us. As you all know, traditionally, pneumonias were more common in the young, uh, and, uh, and also a little more common in the older populations. Uh, and the reason for that is of course, uh, you have an immature immune system in the early days of life, and you have immune decay or immune senescence as you grow older. So you have that curve that we were seeing for a very long time, uh, where you've got a lot of disease in the very young, and the younger that individual, the higher the risk of disease, and the older that individual, the greater the risk of disease. 
If you look at uh, the age distribution, therefore, of pneumococcal disease and, uh, and compare it with other uh, bacterial pathogens, you can see that the pneumococcus, uh, which is in that, uh, uh, that, 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 that particular color there, the pneumococcus is way ahead of uh, other pathogens in terms of causing uh, community acquired uh, uh, pneumococcal, community acquired infectious disease especially those that are involving um, the upper airways. Uh, these are usually measured in terms of um, uh, DALIs or daily adjusted uh, life years. Uh, and so um, the pneumococcus is a major cause of DALIs uh, uh, at this moment uh, around the world. In our own country, uh, in the days when um, the HIV epidemic was just about to kick in or had just kicked in in, in our country, Instead of having two neat peaks, a peak in the first uh, a few years of life and a peak in the older age group, we had actually another peak somewhere in the middle uh, in young adults. So you see that there were rates of disease that were slightly higher than one, what you would expect in a usual setting among young people, which was attributed to uh, the problem of HIV in young adults, uh, as we will see a little later. HIV is a major, major risk factor for pneumococcal disease. So um, this situation may still be relevant today that we have uh, uh, disease uh, due to infectious disease with the pneumococcus in early life in the first four or five years of life. And then you've got another peak in, uh, in, in young adults, and then you have uh, slightly more uh, of higher rates of disease uh, also in older adults. There are many um, chronic morbid states that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease. And uh, I'm sure uh, people in the room here would uh, uh, be familiar with many of these. Top on that list is of course HIV infection. Uh, and I think for our own setting here, those of us who, or those of you who deal with children and young adults with sickle cell disease will know that uh, uh, these individuals have uh, functional asplenia, and that's a major, major cause of a uh, uh, major, major risk factor for uh, pneumococcal disease. Uh, but there's a long list of, uh, uh, of um, conditions that increase the risk of uh, pneumococcal disease. As it and we need to be familiar with all this uh, because uh, these are the kind of individuals that require uh, special attention in terms of preventing them from developing uh, infectious disease, um, uh, and pneumococcal disease in particular. So I just want to run with you some of the data that uh, has accrued over the years in terms of pneumococcal disease in HIV infected persons because HIV is still a big issue uh, in our country at this moment in time. Uh, this was a, um, a systematic review and meta-analysis that uh, uh, was uh, published several years ago. And if you look at the rates of uh, uh, pneumococcal disease, this is incidence per 100 person years of follow-up. You can see that in our own country, for example, Charles Gilks working uh, at the Kenyatta National Hospital estimated that uh, the incidence of pneumococcal disease in our country was more than 2,500 um, um, people per 100,000 person years of follow-up. So it is a, it's a big problem, or it was a big problem. This was before the antiretroviral treatment uh, era. Now you might say maybe now there is um, um, ART coverage is high, so maybe pneumococcal diseases become less important in HIV-infected individuals, but that's not quite true. If you look at data from South Africa, which is in the lower panel uh, of this figure, you see that the rates of pneumococcal disease in this population is still high despite them being on antiretroviral treatment. So in HIV infected populations up to today uh, in people who are on ART, pneumococcal disease remains an important cause of, uh, uh, or new, the pneumococcus remains an important cause of morbidity and mortality. This is data from the United States, and I just wanted to show you here that compared it to adults, and if you look at what is called the risk ratio, uh, if, you, if you look at a healthy adult 
and you compare them with HIV infected individuals, the rates of disease in those individuals is almost 50 times higher than what you would see in, um, uh, in, in the healthy population. But equally also you can see that people who are diabetic, those who have chronic heart disease and those who have chronic lung disease uh, also have higher rates uh, of uh, uh, pneumococcal disease. What happens when you have had uh, uh, an acute infectious process? Um, because of the inflammatory response that is happening in these individuals, um, ac acute infectious processes, especially those in the respiratory tract and in the urinary tract have been associated with acute coronary events. For example, myocardial acute um, cerebrovascular and acute uh, coronary vascular, uh, acute cardiovascular disease uh, following respiratory infections. And usually these kind of things would happen a few days um, uh, after the respiratory tract infection. So people who have uh, uh, risk factors for um, um, acute cardiovascular events, getting a respiratory tract infection is bad for them because they can end up with a, uh, a, a cardiovascular event happening within a few days uh, or a few weeks of, um, uh, of the respiratory tract infection. So this is um, uh, a demonstration of the link between infectious disease and non-communicable diseases that uh, uh, we all should be familiar uh, with. And really the driver of these events uh, is uh, inflammation. So we have a problem, all of us, even though our life expectancy in Kenya is still relatively low, but generally speaking, uh, globally, the uh, population is aging. And therefore the population that is becoming elderly is growing all over, all over the world. Uh, in our country, there is a, a small proportion of individuals, I think it's estimated at about four to, uh, four to five percent or less that are over the age of 65, but that population is likely uh, to increase as we go forward. And, uh, and, and, and as the aging population, as, a, as the population ages, you will end up seeing more and more um, uh, infectious disease in these individuals, including the pneumococcus. And this has actually been demonstrated very well uh, with what we see uh, with COVID-19 now that uh, uh, causes devastating effects if it affects people who are uh, older than the age of uh, 55 or so. So it's been estimated that between the year 2015 and 2050, the proportion of the world's population that will be over the age of 60 will double uh, from about 12% to about 22%. By 2020, this was uh, last year, the number of people aged 60 years and older uh, was going to uh, outpace children younger than five years. And, um, 80% of the people who will be old will be living in countries like ours, the so-called low and middle income country. And the pace of population aging is much faster than in the past. And therefore we need to be aware that uh, we will have uh, uh, health issues because we will have to manage frailty and disability uh, in uh, the aging population, which basically means we have to worry about infectious disease, and have to continue worrying about pneumococcal disease, which is a big issue in the elderly. Now, one of the things that, uh, uh, so, so, so this, this is what WHO says we should all do. Uh, we can of course age rapidly, uh, which is uh, that line there, or we can age with a lot of acute incidents like falls and what have you. But really if we, if we were all to do the right things and get everything right, we really should be following that pathway there, which is called healthy aging. And we could anticipate to get to age 90. And how do we uh, get there? It is basically three or four things, social networks, exercise, and improved nutrition. Those are the kind of things that might help all of us to age uh, uh, in a healthy way. So maybe just to, um, highlight, uh, give you a summary of the burden of pneumococcal disease. Uh, if you look at uh, the last uh, uh, 
um, report of uh, the global burden of disease collaborators. These are individuals who uh, have taken upon themselves to estimate uh, morbidity and mortality patterns across the world on almost a year by year basis. And uh, they estimated that in, uh, in 2015, almost 3 million people died of a lower respiratory tract infection. And of these, pneumococcal disease caused uh, uh, um, a major bulk of, uh, of those infections. So nearly 95% of the infections were caused by pneumococcal disease. The most at risk populations are those who are aged below two years and others who are 65 years and older. It does appear that uh, uh, the burden of, uh, lower, of pneumococcal disease is decreasing in children under the age of five, but could be increasing in those who are over the age of 70. So uh, that's why uh, uh, understanding aging and aging processes is an important thing for us. Let's now turn on to issues related to care and treatment of pneumococcal disease. And I think um, as a pulmonologist, I will focus my attention mainly on uh, pneumonia. I will not deal so much with uh, uh, meningitis. But I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the key recommendations that came out of the 2019 Infectious Disease Society of America and the American Thoracic Guidelines for Managing Community Acquired Pneumonia. You might ask me, why don't we have a Kenyan guideline? And unfortunately, we don't have one. We are in the process of developing a guideline for this country uh, that would uh, be considered a national guideline for managing community acquired pneumonia, but we don't have one at this moment. There are institutions in this country that have developed uh, uh, institutional based guidelines for managing community acquired pneumonia, but it hasn't, uh, we don't have a document that we can call our national guidelines. And I suspect that when we do eventually develop that guideline, we will borrow heavily from international guidelines such as the IDSA or ATS guidelines. So number one, who do you need to do a sputum culture on if you are suspecting that an individual has a community acquired pneumonia? And the IDS guidelines are saying, don't do it unless you are dealing with patients who are in hospital, who have severe disease, or those that you think might have methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus or pseudomonas aeruginosa. Who should we do blood cultures on? Again, don't bother doing this kind of thing in their patient setting, but do it in people who may be, who are in hospital uh, and uh, who have severe disease. The story of procalcitonin is, uh, uh, is, I think, an important one for us. And a lot of people tend to say, if a procalcitonin is normal, then maybe I'm not dealing with a bacterial infection. And that's not completely true. Um, of course, a very high procalcitonin probably is pointing you to, um, uh, to uh, a bacterial infection, but not necessarily so. And what the IDSC and the ATS guidelines um, um, recommended is that you should not do, uh, you should not make your decisions on whether to or not to initiate antibiotic treatment based on the procalcitonin. But you may want to use the procalcitonin to decide on when you will stop an antibiotic. Steroids are not recommended except maybe in patients who have septic shock because of a community acquired pneumonia. And if you're going to put people on treatment for community acquired pneumonia, you have two choices. That's what most of us will do. You can treat them with a beta-lactam antibiotic with a macrolide. That's the favored, uh, that is the favored uh, uh, way forward. Or you can use a beta-lactam with or without a fluoroquinolone. Uh, so, so those are the recommendations that came out of the 2019 IDSA ATS guidelines that I think all of us should be uh, familiar with because all of us do manage pneumonias. And I think it's really important out there that people need, you need to confirm that you are in, uh, the person across the table truly has a pneumonia. And as we all know, that pneumonia will present itself with a cough, a fever, usually with some form of fast breathing. When you listen to that chest, you may be able to hear bronchial breath sounds. Do not use crackles as, a, as, as an indicator that this individual has pneumonia. 
please, wherever possible, confirm the pneumonia with a chest radiograph. That's really, really key. Very basic things that we should be doing in these individuals, even in their patient setting, unless the circumstances don't allow it, please get a chest radiograph if you can to confirm that this individual has a pneumonia. And then do all the things that need to be done to confirm severity, make a decisions on whether you will admit to hospital or not admit, that kind of thing. But those are basic um, recommendations that came out of the uh, IDS ATS guidelines. In um, um, identifying streptococcus pneumonia as the cause of your pneumonia, there are many things you can do. Uh, we've already said you can do sputum culture in hospitalized patients, you can do blood cultures in hospitalized patients, but you can also use the urinary antigen test. It has a modest sensitivity for this particular pathogen, and if it is positive in patients with bacteremia, it actually tells you that this individual has a high risk for being admitted to the ICU, they may fail treatment, and they may have adverse outcomes. So, Urinary antigen testing is often not used in this country, or it's not that expensive. And I would urge all of us to use it, especially in, uh, in patients who are in, in the hospital setting. Let's now look at drug resistance streptococcus pneumonia. If we are going to be treating our patients uh, with the strep pneumo, we need to understand what the antibiotic susceptibility profiles are. We have a problem all over the world. This is data from children uh, um, in Kibera and Western Kenya uh, that was published uh, several years ago. Uh, and uh, what I would want to highlight here is the high rates of uh, resistance to cotimoxazole and high rates of resistance to penicillin. So much so that I think it may be difficult for us to start treating people with say uh, amoxicillin, for example. I think we, we like using amoxicillin sometimes, but it's probably a, use, a useless medicine in people who truly have pneumococcal disease in our setting. You can see that the use of Levo and Ketriazone at that particular moment uh, was, still, uh, was still okay. And very old drugs that we hardly ever use now, like chloramphenicol, uh, might still be useful in managing children and uh, who have uh, uh, pneumococcal uh, disease. So if you look at the uh, uh, rates of uh, drug resistant streptococcus pneumonia across the world, uh, this is not among the big ones that cause a lot of problems because of drug resistance, um, uh, but you have a global average of about 1.3% of isolates of strep pneumo being drug resistance. We have unfortunately as a continent, the highest rates of uh, pneumococcal drug resistance. And that's understandable because uh, in our setting, antibiotic uh, availability is uh, not a problem. Uh, antibiotics are available to people anywhere, anytime. Uh, if you want to understand what is driving uh, um, resistance in this uh, uh, step pneumo, the, the, the mechanisms are basically two or three. Um, mutations in the penicillin binding proteins or, 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 or um, um, mutations in uh, what the development or evolution of what is called efflux pumps uh, and um, uh, evolution of genes uh, that uh, uh, subserve erythromycin resistance. So those are the major mechanisms for the development of uh, pneumococcal resistance. Now, finally, I think we go into um, um, reviewing the data with you uh, on how to prevent pneumococcal disease. There are two vaccines that are currently available, uh, the 23 valent polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine, uh, which was introduced into the world many years ago. The first polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine was uh, introduced into the world in 1977 or thereabout, and the 23 valent polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine came a few uh, a few years later. Um, if you vaccinate people, uh, about 80% of those who've been vaccinated will develop uh, antibodies within about two to three weeks. Um, and however, you need to know that older adults 
and those with chronic disease and immunosuppressive states may have a less robust response. The response may, uh, antibody response would last about five years or so. It tends to be very effective or 60 to 70% of, uh, uh, of uh, serious invasive pneumococcal disease um, um, due to serotypes that are covered in the, in the vaccine will be covered. Uh, by this uh, polysaccharide vaccine. But please remember not to call it a pneumonia vaccine because uh, the 23 valent polysaccharide vaccine is not effective in preventing non bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia. It also does not affect courage rates among vaccinees, and there's usually no change in population level distribution of vaccine types and non vaccine types. So, from a part an epidemiological perspective, uh, vaccinating people with the 23 valent polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine does not change the epidemiological dynamics of this germ uh, in the population. One study done in Uganda several years ago showed zero efficacy in uh, people who are vaccinated with the, the 23 valent pneumococcal vaccine. Um, and so this raised the issues about whether we should be using this vaccine in that population that is at a very high risk of pneumococcal disease. Fortunately, that was followed a few years later by a, a, one of the first few studies in the African continent uh, showing that uh, uh, the seven valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine uh, was efficacious in preventing pneumococcal disease with a vaccine efficacy that was estimated at about 74% or so. However, one needs to be aware that uh, immunogenicity may be lower in HIV-infected individuals who have got low CD4 uh, T cell counts. Uh, so um, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccines uh, and most people now are using PCV13, that is uh, uh, the conjugate vaccine that has got 13 serotypes in there. And I know that people are beginning to develop more and more um, um, uh, vaccines that are, are cover slightly more um, serotypes. But uh, if you look at uh, uh, invasive pneumococcal disease that is covered by vaccine types, you can reduce the incidence of uh, uh, of that uh, of, of these serotypes in terms of disease caused by these serotypes by 97%. You can also reduce nasopharyngeal carriage rates, which is very, very important because it means in the population generally, uh, within, uh, within that population, you reduce rates of pneumococcal disease and, um, and you therefore achieve something close to herd immunity. And this has been seen, for example, in the Kilifi area of the Kenyan coast, uh, where after introduction of the uh, PCV10 in 2011, rates of uh, invasive pneumococcal disease declined and vaccine type courage rates in the population also uh, decreased. The CAPITA trial is an extremely important trial. It is actually the, uh, I think, probably the only randomized clinical trial that looked at, uh, uh, at uh, efficacy of the PCV13 uh, in adults population. It was a large study, it was a Dutch study, very, very large study that looked at uh, uh, nearly 85 or so thousand adults over the age of uh, 65. Uh, the PCV13 was efficacious in preventing um, vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia. It was also efficacious in uh, reducing non bacteremic pneumonia which you remember the P, PPV23 cannot do. And, um, uh, and uh, very importantly, nearly three quarters of all forms of uh, invasive pneumococcal disease were pre uh, prevented using, uh, those are the major trial results of the CAPITA trial. Um, if you look at the public health impact of the CAPITA trial, uh, the authors of, uh, or rather those who are, um, conducted this trial uh, looked at the data again and were able to demonstrate that you could reduce the number of hospitalization, number of, uh, um, of um, um, uh, ICU days of hospitalization, you reduce the number of ICU admission, reduce the number of days in ICU, and the number that you need 
to vaccinate to prevent one hospital, uh, one hospitalization or ICU admission was pretty low, which basically means that vaccination has a good public health impact out there. Because if you can do all these things, then that's a good public health intervention as it were. However, we have a problem with vaccination across the world, not just in our country, but across the world. And I just give you a bit of data uh, for those of you who believe that uh, the United States may be one place where you might want to learn lessons. First of all, diseases that have, uh, uh, can be pre prevented um, through vaccination in adults. And I put COVID-19 there because it's a new one in the block and it is also vaccine preventable. But you can see there's a long list of, uh, of diseases that you can prevent. However, if you look at vaccine coverage rates in at risk population, this is of course United States data, uh, you can see it, uh, in terms of coverage of annual influenza vaccination, less than 50% of people are receiving it. Pneumococcal vaccine, uh, very low. Uh, maybe uh, in those of us 65 who should all be vaccinated, you're only doing about 60%. If you look at herpes zoster, only 20% of those uh, in whom the vaccine is recommended were getting it. And if you look at the at diphtheria, very, very small amount, only about 16.8% of people are receiving this vaccine. So we have a problem with, them, uh, with vaccination across the world, including in our own country here. We have low vaccine coverage rates. We have concerns about, uh, uh, for the pneumococcus in particular, uh, if you vaccinate people with, uh, say, the PCB13 or the uh, polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine 23, you are not covering a lot of serotypes. And uh, it is possible that you could start seeing a surge of disease due to um, what some people call replacement serotypes. And that's why people are working to try and expand uh, the range of serotypes that are covered uh, with the uh, available vaccines. But many of us do not know that we need to vaccinate adults against many things. The population doesn't know. And now you've got uh, something called vaccine hesitance. It's happening with COVID-19 and it'll probably happen with, I mean, it's also happening with pneumococcus and then um, influenza and others. And I think we probably haven't given, our government probably hasn't given uh, vaccination of the adult population except for COVID-19. Uh, I think we haven't really given um, uh, this, uh, uh, this issue as much attention as we should have. So to be able to develop a successful um, adult vaccination program, this is what some people have said we should be doing. Healthcare professionals, which means KMA, KP, K, whatever, all those groups must be, uh, must be at the forefront of partnering with the agencies that are required to, we, we are required to partner to advance vaccination. The government must of course provide the resources to be able to do this and the policies and what have you. Uh, the media can support uh, vaccine development programs and the public must understand and accept uh, vaccinations. So there's a lot of players that need to, uh, need to be engaged to be able to advance uh, vaccination. Um, before the COVID uh, era, these were the vaccines that uh, uh, our government or rather the Minister of Health uh, had recommended. I'm not quite sure whether these uh, recommendations have changed recently. This is a little bit of an old uh, uh, policy document, um, uh, but the last time I checked, we didn't have any new policy documents on vaccination. But you can see there, cancer patients should have hepatitis B, PCB13, and 23 polyvalent uh, um, pneumococcal vaccine, HIV infected individuals, PCB13, and Hep B, C class diabetics, Hep B, PCB13, pneumococcal vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, and seasonal influenza elderly persons and here is very interesting. I don't consider myself elderly, but I'm over the age of 50 and, uh, and uh, you can see the uh, Kenyan um, uh, policy makers consider me an elderly person and I should be getting my PCV 13, my pneumococcal vaccine, 23 valent pneumococcal vaccine and seasonal influenza. 
Uh, and if you have uh, jiggers, you need your tetanus uh, vaccine. So those are the recommendations. And I think maybe um, COVID-19 will be added in there. So in conclusion, um, vaccination, ladies and gentlemen, is an integral component of the package of interventions that is intended to improve, promote health living. Those of us who are adults, whether we do or we don't have uh, uh, certain uh, chronic morbid stress should consider, first of all, getting vaccinated ourselves and promoting vaccination to our adult population. We know that uh, the proportion of adults that is uh, receiving vaccination in this uh, country or who should be receiving vaccination in our country is growing uh, and, and, and they should. I, I think we, we have a responsibility to ensure that these individuals actually do get their vaccinations. If we are going to be vaccinating people, we need to remember that the pneumococcus is an important cause of morbidity and mortality in adults, and especially in those with certain chronic morbid states. And therefore we should also prioritize vaccination against the pneumococcus in this group. Um, if we are going to be vaccinating adults against the pneumococcus, we need to know that PCB13 is efficacious uh, and should therefore be part of our adult vaccination programs. Um, I want to thank you most sincerely uh, for listening to me and I'm more than happy to take questions at some point in this, uh, uh, in the course of the night. Thank you. Asante Sana Daktari for that very insightful uh, educational presentation. Uh, at this point, I will jump straight to the Q&A session. Uh, from the Q&A box, I can see two questions. Uh, the first question is from Irene Olo. Uh, she's asking, kindly confirm if steroids can be used in the pneumococcus pneumonia superimposed on, superimposed on tuberculosis and at what point? The second question, if you could tackle the first and I will come up with the second one, yeah. <clears throat> so thank you, Irene. There is no role for both for steroids in both uh, pneumococcal disease and also in tuberculosis. Uh, there are only two situations where you might want to consider uh, uh, using steroids in TB. Uh, people who have got tuberculous meningitis and those with the uh, pericardial TB and maybe genital urinary TB. And those, as you might be aware, form less than 10, 15% of all cases of TB globally, including in our own country here. And the reason you may want to consider steroids in, that, in those groups is that uh, you want to avoid the complications that can come out of, uh, uh, of TB, you know, like constrictive pericarditis or, 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 or blockage of uh, genital urinary system or hydrocephalus in people who have uh, meningitis. But other than those three, uh, three conditions, there is no role for steroids in tuberculosis treatment. And the same story happens with the pneumococcus. You really should not use the steroids, except maybe in people who are in septic shock in which you can follow the usual guidelines that would happen in people in critical care. Uh, the second question is from Dr. Moses Sifuma, and he asked, does, does vaccination lead to super selection of other virulent serotypes? So this is what is called the replacement serotypes. And yes, it has been shown that, uh, especially when we were using the PCV7, initially when uh, conjugate vaccines came into being, uh, the earlier ones were based on seven serotypes. Um, and then we went to 10 serotypes and now we have 13 serotypes. So when we were using the seven uh, and to some extent the 10 serotypes, there was breakthrough disease that would come through because of uh, um, serotypes that were not covered uh, by the vaccine. Uh, they are called replacement serotypes. And that's why I said repeatedly that um, uh, the future might be uh, <clears throat> the development of a vaccine that does not in fact depend on serotypes. It elicits uh, immunological responses that are independent of the serotypes, which would mean we can cover all the 97 or 100 serotypes that are currently out there. 
uh, or we could um, we could expand the repertoire of serotypes that are covered in the vaccine and people are working on those and uh, uh, I think in the near future there will be vaccines that will be able to cover uh, more and more serotypes as it were. Uh, <clears throat> we have another question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what is the rationale of the order of vaccination between PCV13 and PPSV23? So generally speaking, most guidelines will say you should give both. Um, and uh, the order is, um, uh, will depend to some extent on, on which country you are in. Um, but don't give them at the same time. Uh, your bare minimum is at least eight weeks apart. So you can start with PCV13 and go to PPV, PPSV23 uh, or the other way around. Um, and really it makes sense. You see your PCV13 covers you again as the most common um, serotypes that cause disease, but not, not everyone, in fact, you're basically covering about 62, if I remember correctly, maybe 62 to 70 percent of disease due to uh, due, due to all pneumococcal disease, uh, and your 23 valent pneumococcal uh, vaccine or polysaccharide vaccine covers a little more serotypes. So, so that's really the rationale. You want to cover as many serotypes as you can by combining these two. You have a bigger immunological responses with your PCV13, especially in certain groups. So for example, if you're with the adults, you get robust immunological responses with PCV13 uh, and you augment that by expanding uh, your antibody responses by giving PPSV23, but they should not be given at the same time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ari. The last question tonight is, uh... What antibiotic or antibiotics do you recommend as first line with CAP in outpatient setup? So um, I would say use a beta lactam antibiotic. And I think for me, um, my own practice, I tend to use coamoxiclav because coamoxiclav tends not to disappoint me. But you can use sepuroxime, you can use. Uh, uh, you, I think the only thing that I am a bit hesitant to is to use uh, uh, penicillin that have been used for a long time. So penicillin B, amoxicillin and stuff like those because those are unlikely to work. Now, um, uh, like as I highlighted, it may be a good thing to combine a beta lactam together with, an, uh, uh, with a macrolide. And we need to understand why that is so. Mark, uh, beta lactams will not work against your, uh, what we used to call a typical pathogen. So if you're dealing with mycoplasma, you're dealing with Legionella, you are dealing with the chlamydophila or something, those will not be touched by your beta lactam antibiotic. Now, the rates of uh, um, uh, the prevalence or rates of uh, disease due to these uh, atypical pathogens is uncertain in our own situation here, but um, there's one or two studies that our friends across in the north in Ethiopia have done, and they are claiming that up to 20 to 30 percent of uh, patients there have a typical pathogen. So to cover their typical pathogens, you want to use a macrolide. Why would we not use a, um, a fluoroquinolone? And I really want to emphasize that, that maybe a fluoroquinolone should not be you, your first choice. Um, Anthony J. Scott, working in the Kenyan coast many years ago, uh, found that nearly 10% of patients with typical community acquired pneumonia had tuberculosis. And fluoroquinolones, therefore, can, uh, can delay the diagnosis of TB. Uh, it can make you, um, you know, uh, it can also generate fluoroquinolone resistance in TB, uh, which would propagate drug resistant TB, which is a much bigger problem. Uh, so unless you're really very certain uh, and you're a very good clinician and you've uh, done lots of work to be able to understand that this individual does not have TB, you probably want to avoid a fluoroquinolone. Thank you much, uh, very much, Dr. Ari. Uh, at this juncture, in the interest of time, uh, I would like to thank you for the presentation and the, uh, I'll pass on the other questions that I 
you've not been able to answer right now. Uh, at this point, uh, I would like to welcome our partner who has uh, enabled us to all this CME today, uh, Pfizer Pharmaceutical. Uh, I want to welcome Michael Mutua for a small product presentation. Karibu, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Peter, and good evening, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Dr. Chakaya, for that uh, wonderful presentation. And I think you've covered um, much. And so mine is just to, to finalize and really to appreciate your reminder on how we should age healthy up to 90 years. I, I look forward to that. And I mean, one of the, one of the um, key, key, key pointers or uh, one of the ingredients to aging healthily is just having this prevention of some of the infections that have the vaccines available. And, and, and today we were talking about pneumonia. And so Pfizer is also proud to, to share with you or to partner with every HCP to provide such a breakthrough in terms of prevention of um, pneumococcal disease and especially in adults. We have as a country emphasized so much on pediatric vaccination and kind of forgotten about the adults. But when you look at um, the kind of uh, uh, conditions that we have with adults, the HIV, uh, diabetes, uh, chronic heart disease and kidney failure, then we say we need, we need a preventive measure for the secondary infections that might come up when we are trying to manage the primary infections. And one of that, I mean, the primary condition and one of that infection is, is pneumonia. And so Prevna 13 is a, is a pneumococcal conjugate uh, vaccine by Pfizer, and which actually uh, serves in both pediatric population and adult population. And just to, to mention something is in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the recent past, from my observation, I've, I've realized that as we minimize the anti-vaxxers in adults, you realize there are also more children coming in to get the vaccines because when the parent appreciates vaccination, then they're also able to pass the same benefit to the, to the, the child. And so one of the, um, one of the key things that I think we should emphasize on is to recommend vaccination, regardless of which infection, to, to vaccinate against such. If there's a vaccine available, then we should not lose a patient to such an infection. So why do we say Prevna 13 is a, is a beneficial vaccine for your patients and you only need one dose? Because if you look at it, it's a conjugate vaccine. And so that ensures that there's immune memory. It's a T cell dependent uh, kind of uh, you know, immune, immune, immune response. So once that happens, then you do not need to revaccinate the patient. And that also ensures compliance. A lot of patients will not need to remember, I need to go back for a booster dose with Prevna 13. So once you give it, then, then, then that's it. And so my recommendation is that we change maybe the approach right now. If you're managing a patient on diabetes, we can start by asking what are the vaccines that you've received? Because we have various vaccines and as we will see, some of them are given together with Prevna 13. And, and that means, if, if it's a single dose, then there's compliance also. So the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine is recommended and approved. Uh, from this slide, you can see it's from ages 50 years and above. And this is because this is what uh, Dactaria has discussed uh, uh, majority of the time, but also for adolescents and also for young adults below 50 years, you can get a single dose. As long as you're two years and above, you're, you're eligible for a single dose of, of Prevna 13. The other thing to mention is, if you look at, at this slide, as the, I mean, as we have, as more, the more underlying conditions we have, the more the chances the patient will have to contract IPD. Now, the goal that we look at is, uh, as, as, and, and this need to come, we need to come together as partners, Pfizer, the HCP, and also the patient to agree to be vaccinated is that if we need to reduce the lag disease, I mean, the, 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 the chances of you contracting IPD if you have a lag disease from five to 17 times to zero, then it takes an effort of you know, recommending a vaccine. So for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, immunocompromised patients, or patients who have gone through transplant, they can still get or benefit 
from the new mucocon conjugate vaccine by Pfizer, which is Prevna 13. And they only need a single dose. So as I said, in the next days or the next day, when you see a patient, you can change the approach and tend to know how many vaccines they have received because vaccination right now is the most effective clinical preventive measure that we can have in our country and to have a healthy population. Now, as I mentioned, Prevna 13 is given together with some of the vaccines. And one of them, uh, the commonly one is influenza vaccine. So when the patient comes, they can get them at the same time, as long as you're, you're injecting uh, different injection sites. And for Prevna, it's IM. You just inject on, on, on the deltoid muscle and one dose is enough for that patient. Now, they might have some few side effects, which, which will range from headache, but they clear, you know, headache ir irritation or hardening on the injection site, but they clear with, within a short period of time. So you can safely administer. And also I saw WHO recommending that every patient getting flu vaccine can also get uh, Prevna or pneumococcal vaccine, especially this period of COVID. It helps to prevent a lot of complications that come in when, you know, uh, in, in, in case the patient contracts the, the disease. And also we need to act and break the silence because we also look at what is the cost effectiveness of vaccination? Because a single dose of Prevna will cost the patient 6,000 shillings. But comparing that to the cost of admission and the cost of medication, you would rather choose the vaccination. But then the other question is, do we have these patients? And what is the historic history looking like? What has it been like when we get a patient who has diabetes or you know, heart disease and they contract pneumonia? Have we ended up losing the patient or have we ended up spending a lot of money in admission and treatment? How about if we gave a single dose of Prevna 13 and avoided all those you know, uh, expenses and losses and all that? Because at the end of the day, they will have a societal or economic impact. So as, as, as doctor presented about the capital trial impact, we need to minimize hospitalizations. We need to minimize the number of visits that we have with patients, and we need to minimize the ICU stay period. So my recommendation and my request for each one of us is let us recommend vaccination and especially against pneumonia. Pneumonia is a leading um, uh, vaccine preventable, you know, you know that is, is causing a lot of mortality. So we need to minimize that. And to reduce that, it's only a step about vaccination. So let us take that step, break the silence about pneumonia. We do not need to keep quiet until we start managing the disease. We can prevent the disease and then take care of you know the other the other the other you know take care of the primary disease and also this prevention will improve um, the, the the primary disease management so prevention of the secondary infections will give a better treatment outcome of the primary uh, condition so prevna 13 is available as a single vial and it's available in almost every town now and almost every pharmacy and um, you can you can you can prescribe and or you can stock, so it, it it will depend. And I think I shared my contact at the beginning. Maybe I'll share again. In case you have challenges with access to Prevna 13, you can always contact me or any of my colleagues that you know, and we'll able we'll be able to effectively effectively partner for our patients to get the best. So thanks a lot for for your time. And I look forward to any question that might be coming up. So here is my contact. Thank you so much, Peter. That's all. Uh, Asante, Sana, Asante Sana, Michael, for that uh, very educative uh, uh, session on the Prevena. <clears throat> uh, at this juncture, I want to thank uh, all the attendees for attending this uh, CME tonight, it was organized by KMA Nairobi Division in conjunction with uh, Pfizer Pharmaceutical. Uh, next week, we'll be having another 
webinar with uh, Pfizer Pharmaceutical. It will be hosted by KMA Kisumu Division. Uh, as you can see on your screen, you'll be receiving the links uh, tomorrow. Uh, as per the CPD, uh, the CPD will be sent out to the email registered to attend this CME. Uh, with the CPD, the link for this upcoming webinar will be, will be, will be there too. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ari, for the, for the presentation tonight. Uh, it was really insightful and educative. And uh, at this point, uh, I want to thank you all and wish everyone a lovely night. Asante Nisana. <laughs>